All right. Have you ever heard somebody say that winning? People tend to say that because that feels better, um, especially when they're not winning. Winning isn't everything. Um, and if it's a game, we often say, it's only a game. I mean, I find myself saying that a lot to the guys I play ball with. I play ball with a lot of very competitive guys, and some, I, a lot of times I know when not to say that, too, but <laughs> you want to say that so that they, um, so they don't take it too seriously. It's supposed to, senior softball is supposed to be about fun and fellowship and fitness. So there isn't no competitive in there, but we tend to get that way. And we all like to win, right? I mean, nobody likes to lose. And we all know in our heads that winning is in everything, but we really hope that losing is in everything, too. So when, you know, after I come home playing a game of ball, Gary will often ask me, he goes, how'd you do? Well, if we won, I'll say, oh, we won, and I'll say how much, and I'll say how big my contribution was, how many times I hit the ball, especially if I got it in the outfield past the Rovers, and that'll be great. And, you know, if we've lost, a lot of times I'll say, well, I did okay, and then I'll say what I did, but then I'll say how badly we lost. Sometimes it's close, sometimes we get slaughtered. You know, sometimes there's been a season, oh, it was a long time ago, but I think one year, I think we lost every single game. Um, that is not a fun thing to remember. And um, it doesn't happen too often anymore. But that's, you know, we all have bad days and we all have good days. And if your teams are evenly matched, somebody's got to lose. And that's just the way it goes. I mean, any good team can win on any given day and anybody can lose, just, that's just how it happens. In life, those times of winning and losing are just much more serious. When we fail, we will, and we will, we have the choice to make either get up and start over or to throw in the towel and give up. The problem is that life is filled with peaks and valleys. We, we go from one to the other and sometimes the ball is in, sometimes the ball is out, sometimes we make that basket, Sometimes we miss it entirely. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. He didn't say you might. He didn't say it would be a possibility. He said, you will have trouble. Job echoes this too. He says, a man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. The old adage says, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. I like John Maxwell's twist on it. He says, sometimes you lose, Sometimes you'll learn. Well, you see this displayed throughout history with people that have accomplished great deeds. People like Henry Ford. He failed two times that resulted in bankruptcies prior to his successful automobile company, Ford Motor Company. R.H. Macy, he failed seven times before his store in New York caught on. The English novelist, John Creasy, he got 753 rejection slips before he published 564 books. Thomas Edison, he went through 10,000 prototypes of the light bulb before he got it right. He really was persistent. J.K. Rowling wrote Harry Potter in the, I heard it was a Sorcerer's Stone was the first one, as a struggling single mom on welfare, and she had received 12 rejection slips before that book caught on and she, only, she sold that first one for 4,000 pounds. The series went on to break numerous sales record, turned, an incredibly, turned into a really good film series and earned a permanent place in the hearts of children and adults all over the world. J.K. Rowling is now worth more than a billion dollars. Michael Jordan said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. And I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot 27 times and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life, he said, and that is why I succeed. It isn't that people that succeed never fail. It's that they don't let that stop them. They refuse to let the failure define them or their dream or their future. And I believe God uses our failures to teach us and to form us into the men and the women that he has planned for us to be. For many of us, we're just afraid to risk and take chances because we might fail. J.K. Rowling said, it is impossible to live without failing at something unless you live so cautiously that you might as well have not lived at all, which 
by which in case you have, in that case you have failed by default. As a single mom, she faced numerous hardships. And then she got all those rejection slips. It would have been easy for her to just say, I better get a different job. I must not be going to be a writer. But instead, she continued until she sold that first book. So as we look into the word of God this morning, we can see all sorts of men and women that have started and failed, that have tried things and, and not made it. I mean, we saw, saw Moses a while back where he ended up in the wilderness after murdering someone. That's a pretty big fail. And then we have David and Bathsheba, David who committed adultery as the king and committed a murder to cover it up. That's a big fail. But they both came out as men of God and followed God. We're going to look at a guy named John Mark this morning. And the first time we hear about him, Peter is going to, a, to John Mark's house for a prayer meeting because Peter had been spending the whole night in jail and didn't know if he was going to get out and some angel God delivered Peter out of jail, so he went to tell the people at John Mark's house this. He goes, the Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from the Jewish leaders that had planned to do to me. And when Peter realizes, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. So that is the first reference we have to this young man. The church was meeting in his mother's home in Jerusalem, so their home was large enough to have a pretty good-sized meeting room. And they... So we don't even meet John Mark. We just know that this is the house that he grew up in and this is his mom's house. Like many of us, John Mark failed early on in his Christian life. And even though he was a believer, he didn't always get it right. So we're gonna look at John Mark today and we're, we're gonna start with in Acts 13, beginning at verse four. So if you have your Bibles, you can start. It's Acts is right after, after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And... It starts at verse 4 this morning. It should be on the screen as well this morning. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. There in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark with, went with them as their assistant. Afterward, they traveled from town to town across the entire island until finally they reached Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye, and he said, You son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, and the enemy of all that is good, will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. When the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. Paul and his companions then left Paphos by the ship of Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. There, John, Mark, left them and returned to Jerusalem. But Paul and Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia. So John, Mark, left them. We don't know why. It doesn't say. You know, they've been traveling a while. <clears throat> they got to Paphos. It was a 263-mile journey northwest of Jerusalem. And there we saw the governor become a Christian, where Paul had just basically took out this sorcerer, took, took away his power. And so the governor was able to hear the truth and to accept it and become a Christian. And that's so exciting. I mean, John Mark was a witness to that. And they were all there together seeing that and listening to that. That's pretty powerful stuff. And then after that, they went on and they were going to continue on this missionary journey. And John Mark was going with them and they got to Perga which is another 185 miles as a, as a crow flies. And then they came, <clears throat> but then John Mark, for some reason, did not want to continue with them. He decided he's going to go home. Now, by land, they were like 900 miles back to Jerusalem. I assume, you know, he got back on a ship somehow and got back. But, you know, Luke doesn't tell us why John Mark went home. But imagine Paul and Barnabas. They're on this trip. They had an assistant. 
They had these people going with them, and now the guy halfway through the trip turned around and went home. Some of us have been there. Some of us have had a crew together. We've planned something. We've got everybody to do the work. And then somebody in the, in the schedule and the crew decides, uh, nope, I'm going home. I quit. What happens to the other guys that are left that are still doing the work? What happens to their workload? It gets bigger, doesn't it? Wait, somebody's got to pick up the slack. Somebody's got to get that work done. So that's where they were. I mean, we've had that happen here at South Train. All of us have had that happen. You've got a group together and you're going to get some work done. And then somebody at the last minute calls. Maybe they got sick. Maybe there was an emergency. Sometimes maybe they just forgot or didn't tell you. And it, it, you come up a man short and it's tough. Well, we find out Paul was pretty upset about this. Paul gets pretty upset with Mark about him just leaving. Now, don't get me wrong. We understand emergencies. And if it was an emergency, I don't think Paul would have been so upset. Stuff happens. But there are times when somebody says they're going to be there, and they just, they just don't show up, and they don't even call. And all of a sudden, you're really short, and you're really scrambling. And if that happens over and over again on your crew, you get so you don't trust that person anymore. You don't want to even give them another chance to try it. So John Mark left that missionary journey when they were about half done. But we never really find out why. But in Acts 15 is where we're going to join up with Paul and Mark again and Barnabas. So if you want to turn a couple of pages over to chapter 15, and we're going to start on verse 22 and and read ver up down to verse 40. We aren't going to read all of that, but we're going to read verse 22 and then jump down to verse 30. So what has happened is Paul and Barnabas have returned to Jerusalem. They're getting, um, they're getting an okay from the council there, and then they're going to go back on their second missionary journey with a letter from the, from the council in Jerusalem. The, then the apostles and elders together with the whole church in Jerusalem chose delegates and they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. The men chosen were two of the church leaders, Judas, also called Barsabbas, and Silas. And then I'm going to drop down to verse 30. It says, the messengers went at once to Antioch where they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. Then Judas and Silas, both being prophets, spoke at length to the believers, encouraging and strengthening their faith. They stayed for a while, and then the believers sent them back to the church in Jerusalem with a blessing of peace. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. They and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord there. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated it. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. So when they're starting the second missionary journey, we see that Paul is not too thrilled about bringing along John Mark again. Paul and Barnabas had completed that journey. They were going on to their second one. They wanted to go back and check out how the other churches had done. And Barnabas looked and he said, yeah, that's a good idea. And here's John Mark. I'd like to bring him along. I think he could do it this time. Paul thought about that and he said, no way. No way am I letting him come along again. He deserted us last time. He might do it again. I don't want to take the chance. You know, Paul was hurt, and he was angry. <clears throat> but Barnabas wanted to give him a second chance. Barnabas is also the same guy that gave Paul a second chance, which is kind of ironic that Paul wasn't as easy to do that with John Mark. But Paul is the guy, when he, he used to be Saul, and he was the guy that was um, persecuting the Christians. And when, it was, when, Paul be, when Saul became a Christian... He was, wanted to go visit the disciples in Jerusalem, and they were pretty anxious about that. They weren't too sure of him. And Barnabas came alongside Paul and introduced Paul to the disciples and, and vouched for him that Paul was indeed changed. He was a believer. And so Barnabas is an encourager. Barnabas is a person that gives people second chances. 
And so that's what Barnabas came alongside Paul, and now he's doing the same thing for John Mark. Barnabas believes Mark's ready for a second chance. The di but the disagreement between Barnabas and Paul was so strong, so sharp, it says, that Barnabas and Paul separated and went separate ways. Barnabas took Mark, and Paul took Silas. You know, and God used that because now they both, they cover twice as much ground in the same amount of time. So they were doing a great work together. But I want us to notice a couple of things about Mark. We don't see him arguing. We don't see him begging to come along. We don't see him trying to prove himself to Paul. He just is there. He showed up. You know, that took a lot of courage in the first place to just show up and ask to go along in the period. I mean, it takes a lot of courage to pick yourself up and try again. And so he, he has courage and he's willing to go. And he must have decided that he had matured enough or he had learned enough, but he, was, he had done something in the meantime, I'm sure. You know, there are, we all fear that we'll fail, that we aren't qualified, that we're going to totally bomb. And it takes courage to pick ourselves up and to try again. When we know we're supposed to do something, but we need to be persistent despite the, the possibility of failing. I don't know how many of you have ridden horse, but as a horse rider, when I was a kid, we learned that any time the horse bucks you off, what are you supposed to do? Well, I heard it. Everybody's, yeah, get right back on again. Well, I learned that, and I did it a lot when I was in high school and junior high, the other way around, but I got bucked off a lot, and I end up getting back on a lot. But then about 10 years ago, you know, I had this really nice horse, and we could, I could get on her and go trail riding, and it was no big deal, at least I thought. And this morning, Candy decided, no. <laughs> she, they call it Buddy Sour, and that spring when I got her out to ride, she decided instead of going forward when I told her to go forward, she went backwards, and she went backwards fast. And then she buckled her back legs, and she rolled over. That was to get me off. And it worked. I got off. That's very painful. You know what? I, then that old teaching kicked in, and it said, get back on that horse. So I got back on, and I tried it again. You know what? She did that again. She back up, she rolled over, and I had to get off again. My, my left leg was starting to hurt my ankle about that time, or was I don't remember which one, left or right. And then I, I did it one more time. I got on, I tried to urge her forward, she went fast back, and she buckled her legs, and she rolled over again. You know what they call insanity is when you try the same thing over and over and over again and get the same results? Well, that's what was going on. So I called our trainer, and he gave me a, some tools to put in my box to figure out a way to train her out of that bad habit, and it worked. I mean, then I got back on her, and he told me what to do, and, you know, after that, any time I started to get, when she was starting to back up, I was supposed to get off and, and do some different exercises. By the time I just would barely lift my leg, she would start acting the way she was supposed to, because she realized that she was going to go through the same thing again. But... You know, we have to learn from our failures. We have to find new ways to attack something. We have to find a new experience. And we have to figure out what we did wrong so that when we try again, we can try a different way of doing it. We, so instead of repeating our mistakes, we need to learn from them. Babe Ruth was one of baseball's all-time home run hitters. Did you know he was also the all-time strikeout champion as well? He struck out almost twice as often as he hit home runs. He knew he had to risk striking out in order to hit a home run. You can't hit the ball if you're not swinging. And when he was asked for the secret of his success, Ruth replied, I just keep swinging at him. And that's how he did it. Mark had to risk rejection when he approached Barnabas and Paul. But he didn't let Paul's negative attitude deter him from trying again. And eventually, he earned Paul's trust and appreciation. He had to keep on swinging. When Mark approached Barnabas and Paul again, he must have shown some maturity. Something that told Barnabas he was ready to give him a second chance. You know, we all need a Barnabas in our life, don't we? We need somebody that encourages us and accepts us and pushes us on to try again. And we all need to be a Barnabas to somebody else. <coughs> Excuse me. We need to continue to, to be an encourager and help somebody else. We are all called to be an encourager. Mark had failed on that first journey, but he wanted to try again. And Barnabas, being the patient leader he was, was willing to take young Mark under his wing again. 
Barnabas forgave him and was ready to give him that second chance. Paul took longer. Yet eventually, Paul too recognized that Mark was indeed serious about his commitment to the work of serving Jesus Christ. Over time, Paul changed his mind about Mark and forgave him. In 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul says, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Paul came to the place where Mark was considered helpful to him in the work of the early church. The last mention of Mark occurs in 1 Peter 5.13. Peter calls Mark his son. No doubt a sentimental reference because Mark was so helpful to him. John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark that we have in our Bibles. And we, it is pretty much agreed on that Mark got all the facts from Peter. So basically, Mark was Peter's scribe. And Mark wrote down all of Peter's experiences with Jesus Christ. And that's where the book of Mark comes from. And Mark's account is the shortest gospel. It's also the fastest moving gospel. And if you read Mark, he likes the word immediately. He'll say one thing happened, then immediately following, immediately the next day, immediately Jesus did this. So Mark continues on that bent, but that's how he wrote. He was a good writer. And he must have went to school because he was, like he said, he's a good writer. His family was pretty wealthy because they had a nice house in Jerusalem. We see all those things about Mark. John Mark had a servant's heart. He was humble to assist Paul and Barnabas and Peter, and he didn't worry about getting any credit. In the book of Mark, he never mentions himself. Not once. He tells it from Peter's point of view. Mark, he wasn't a powerful speaker or someone that got a lot of attention. He served quietly in the background. We all need more marks in the work of, of the church and of the things that God has called us to do. We need people that are willing to just help without getting any credit whatsoever. In life, we all fail at something. We may fail when we try to start our own business or when we are working toward a promotion in a company. We might fail in a relationship or friendship. We might fail more than once. In fact, most of us will fail at a lot of things before we really find out or recognize the person that God is creating us to be. Failure isn't final. Winston Churchill said, success is never final. Failure is never fatal. It is the courage to become to continue that counts. As I read, read this next account, I want you to identify who this person is. I don't really want you to say it out loud right away. I want you to listen till the end and then see if you all have the same answer. So be listen, just listen carefully. When I was seven years old, my family was forced out of our home because of a legal technicality. I had to work to help support my family. At age nine, while still a backward shy little boy, my mother died. At age 22, I lost my job as a store clerk. I wanted to go to law school, but my education wasn't good enough. At 23, I went into debt to become a partner in a small store. Three years later, my partner died, leaving me with a huge debt, which took me years to repay. At 28, I had been going with a woman for four years, and I finally proposed. She said no. At 37, on my third try, I was finally elected to the U.S. Congress. Two years later, I ran again and failed to be reelected. I had a nervous breakdown that year. At 41, adding additional heartache to an already unhappy marriage, my four-year-old son died. The next year, I ran for land officer and lost. At 45, I ran for the Senate and lost. A few years later, I ran for the vice presidency and lost. At 49, I ran for the Senate again and lost again. And at age 51, I was elected President of the United States. Who am I? Yeah, as, as all of you kind of guessed, it's Abraham Lincoln. His life looks like one continuous failure, doesn't it? I mean, you would have never thought he'd have made it after all that, but he kept trying. But he kept swinging and became one of the greatest presidents that, that in American history. He realized that failure isn't final. All these people knew that failure wasn't final. When God calls us, the first thing he does, he just asks us to be obedient, to obey. He will take care of the rest. 
God has a master plan, and even when we fail, he will use it to bring us good or use it so that we can bring somebody else good because we'll learn from it. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And in 2 Corinthians, for those of us that have been through just terrible failures or terrible things in our lives, it's a huge reminder that God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are troubled. We will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Through failure, we learn that forgiveness is possible. And so are second chances. Paul forgave Mark and gave him a second chance to prove his worth. Peter was so taken with Mark, he considered him a son. We make a mistake in life. With God's help, we can recover and go on to do great things. Winston Churchill said, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. That's hard to do, but I like how he says that. Don't lose your desire. Don't lose your passion. Don't lose your pursuit of your dreams in life. Everyone experiences failure. But God can turn our messes into greatness. I can say that better. God can turn a great mess into greatness. Choose today that you're not going to allow a temporary setback to become a permanent reality. No more excuses. Lift your head up, set your eyes ahead, and move closer to Jesus Christ. I want to pray, and then we're going to have communion this morning. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the awesome God you are. We thank you that... Failure isn't final. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you take the messes that we make and that you forgive us, that you set us aright, and that you give us second chances. Oh, Lord, and you'll give us second, third, fifth, a hundred chances. And, Lord, we just thank you so much for your awesomeness, for, your, for the awesome God that you are, that you love us so much, that you desire us to succeed, that you didn't create us to fail, Father, but to to grow and to know you better and to be successful in following you, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, God, for that. In your name we pray. Amen. You want to play something? As we go to communion...